Each year, thousands of leaders, innovators, and forward thinkers gather at Workday Rising to explore what's next in the changing world of work. We've unlocked the vault on our most impactful conversations, and we're bringing them directly to you. We dove deep into the strategies and insights shaping our collective future. So prepare to be inspired, challenged, and empowered to make a change. This is the Future of Work podcast, recorded live at Workday rising. Welcome back to Workday Rising live from San Francisco. I'm Kathy Pham, Vice President of AI here at Workday, and I'm so excited to be joined by Dr. Danielle Lee, renowned professor and AI researcher at MIT and a member of Workday's AI Advisory Board. We're so lucky to have her. Danielle's latest research explores how top performers train AI models and how that work affects compensation. Danielle, I'm so excited you're here. I'm so excited to be here as well. So let's start, let's talk big picture. When people discuss AI's impact on productivity, the focus is often on simple automation, but you see a much deeper potential. What is the productivity promise of AI when it's used as a repository to share human expertise? So yeah, so let me, um... Let me step back and just before we even talk about AI, just think about how expertise works in organizations. So, you know, we have an organization that's full of people and people are variable. So some people are going to be very good at some aspects of their jobs and they're not going to be great at other aspects. And the same for other people in the organization. And so what that means is that in an organization, expertise is really scattered. And it's very hard to share that information because if you ask someone who's good at their job, how to be good at their job, and then you ask them to train someone else to be good at similar work, people have a very hard time doing it because it's hard to articulate what makes you good at your job. A lot of it is based on judgment, this kind of expertise and this intuition that you've built up. And so because people are very, have a hard time sharing their knowledge with with each other, the way that organizations grow and the way that organizations as a whole learn ends up being kind of fragmented and uneven. Mm-hmm. I think AI offers the possibility of changing that because what AI is doing is that it's observing people as they work, as you're creating work product. It's kind of monitoring in some sense the output that you're putting down. And by watching you, it can actually learn a lot about what it is, what actions you're taking that make you good at your job uh, in a way that might be difficult for you to explain. Right. And so when you have an organization that has kind of AI integrated into it, what that means is that every single person in the organization has some kind of access to the knowledge and experience and work outputs of the top performers in that organization Mm -hmm. because you're sort of all putting things into a shared kind of training data set. Right. And that also means that moving forward, what happens is that if I discover a new way of doing something and it works, that learning goes into the model and it gets shared with everyone else in the organization. Or if you try something and it turns out that's not such a good idea, that lesson moves into the model as well. Yeah. And it um, you know, prevents other people from wasting resources in the same way. And so what I think that's powerful about AI in this example is that it's not replacing people, but it's sort of serving as a common place for people to put their experiences and expertise. Yeah. So that we're not sort of battling like the limits of human memory yeah. and sort of human sharing. So let's talk about that part of having a shared place of knowledge, if mm-hmm. you will, right? For AI to really learn and be useful, it needs to learn from deep contextual wisdom that individuals have that then they would somehow contribute to these AI training models, these AI systems. Why might an employee be hesitant to perhaps share some of that wisdom? Yeah. So let me give you an example. So I have this prior study that looks at the productivity impacts of a generative AI tool. Yeah. In this particular study, it was looking at people who were providing technical customer support. And essentially what the study shows is that integrating the AI tool increases productivity a lot. Okay. But in particular, it's increasing the productivity of the lowest skilled, sort of most kind of novice workers. And then the high skill workers aren't actually getting that much of an increase. Mm. But the reason why this happens is that what the AI is doing is that it's learning on the conversations of top performers. Top performers are essentially providing the examples mm. that train the model. That model then goes on to make their lower performing colleagues much more productive. What happens now is the firm benefits the novice workers benefit. They're getting paid more. Yeah. Uh, but the top performers who actually kind of birthed all this, they don't get paid anymore. And in fact, they're maybe facing a little bit of competition. You can imagine mm-hmm. a world in which sometimes we talk about AI as an exoskeleton, where AI can support right. us in where we're weakest. 
Um, but in this case, what's happening is that if you're a top performer, you might not necessarily want the firm to, you're investing the exoskeletons of other people. And so now the firm, can someone can hire someone who's less skilled as, than you, mm. put on your exoskeleton right. and do your work. And I think that that's potentially something, I think that's something people are going to realize and they're going to have feelings about. Right. Like treating it as this exoskeleton that might be able to move around, whether or not you get to move with it is a really yeah. interesting Because it's now concept. your skills. It used to be that our skills right. kind of lived in our bodies. So it's very yeah. hard for you to explain to someone else how to be you. Yeah. AI is actually pretty good at observing us and extracting that information. Mm. And so now your expertise no longer lives with you in the same right. way. And that's powerful in the sense that now your expertise can go around, you know, improving everyone else's work. Right. But it's also fraught because it's a thing that's yours and yet it's not yours right. anymore. How do you think companies can get past that? Or how do you think companies can work in that environment and move forward? Yeah, I think what you want to do is to have a collaborative relationship with your top performers mm. and to really rethink the nature of what counts as productivity. We have a very traditional notion of what productivity is, which is I serve a customer. I write a report. That's my productivity. Mm -hmm. But in an AI kind of led organization, uh, my productivity is not just the act of working, but every act is providing examples to build an AI model and to make that model better. And we don't think of that secondary thing as work that should be compensated or recognized. Right. But I think going forward, what you want is you want companies to be very transparent about how they use worker data in the AI models that they use mm -hmm. and to provide recognition for that, um, either in terms of, you know, putting that into metrics when we evaluate people right. or perhaps giving people forms of ownership and forms of payment yeah. for that contribution. So building on that in forms of ownership or payment, how do you think about the compensation model around that? Yeah, no, I think that's interesting. And I think, I think what you want is you want to have a situation where people feel that is in their interest to share their expertise. Mm. And that's not just from a fairness perspective, it's also from a productivity perspective. Because for many jobs, so with the call center workers, I can record people. And for many jobs, a lot of their work is in the recording. So even if I didn't want this to happen, if it's being recorded, it's being recorded. But there are lots of jobs, just some kinds of knowledge work where you, know, you can't, if you put a videotape on me as I'm working, you're not gonna figure out exactly what it is that I'm right. thinking that's gonna help. So what you really want is you want me to feel like a co-creator in this process so that right. I affirmatively offer information that's going to be relevant for training the model, for refining what the AI um, system is able to do. Right. Uh, and so in that world, um, I want to be able to say, you know, put on my resume that I help build this kind of model. I want people to sort of recognize that when they're using this, they're using sort of part of my, my exoskeleton. Yeah. Or in certain cases, I might want to actually be paid for the work that my model does, even if I'm right. not actually doing it. So part of the compensation model sounds like when you contribute data or insights mm -hmm. to a model, yeah. you should also, even as like monetary compensation aside, be able to say, I help train this model. Yeah, uh, I think yeah. you need to sort of recognize that um, what AI does is it expands the notion of what productivity is. Right. In the call center example, those top performers became much more productive, not from their direct work, but from how their data helped the work of other people. Right. And so we need to sort of find ways to make that visible within the yeah, organization. Yeah, yeah. So as these top performers shift from doing work, um, from doing the work to helping train AI systems, mm -hmm. what kind of new jobs, strategic jobs do you see evolving? Yeah, so one thing that I think is interesting is sort of this rise of, the rise of this sort of digital twin where people okay. kind of build models of themselves. And we see this a lot in the labor market. Now, Can you tell more about what a digital twin is? Oh, yeah. So a digital don't. twin is basically it's uh, it's sort of me training an AI model to sort of behave and act as me. Um, and before we even think about that, I think there's um, there's been in a lot of jobs kind of this increasing substackification of work where you see that a lot of journalists, they write for, say, The New York Times but they'll have their own Substack. Mm. Or if you're a real estate agent, you'll work for Coldwell Banker, but you might have your own social media following. Mm. And I think there's an increasing tendency of workers to want to build their own brands, build their own yeah. expertise and benefit from that in a way that's like a little bit separate from what like their job right. at, the, at, the, yeah. at the employer. So I think one of the things that's gonna be challenging and interesting going forward is how do companies give their employees space to do that while also sort of navigating sort of the relationship of who owns yeah. like work and expertise. That back. analogy to the substack of work is so interesting, right? Uh -huh. It's like I have my day job, 
Yeah. But also I know all this other stuff and I'll just like have these other publications that can really amplify what I know. And what having you that do knowledge. within an organization can benefit, like can, you know, you see this with uh, yeah. software engineers where they will, you know, they'll write code for their company, right. but they'll have their own GitHub repository. And when they look for jobs elsewhere, people are going to go and look at their repository. Right. And so there's a way in which as, as workers move from firm to firm or within a firm, yeah. that firm is helping them contribute to the development of their skills. And that's that motivates people to sort of bring the best of themselves to their employers. Yeah. And I think sort of creating a, an interest, like a, a fair balance between, you know, I'm doing this for myself, but also for my company. Right. Um, right. That's such a great way to like really give um, like highlight and give a nod to someone's expertise that they can really own and carry on with yeah. with them. Um, another concept related to this on like the new kinds of roles is a concept of a chief work officer. Mm -hmm. How do you think about management and managing during this time um, with with the way we're training and thinking about training our models? Yeah, I think it's related to that. So a lot of what we talked about are, has been about kind of the expansion of what constitutes someone's productivity, what constitutes someone's expertise, and the boundaries of that kind of being a little bit more blurred. And I think that that's an excellent, it's an excellent time for something like a chief work officer to think about, you know, whether it's whether your work is coming from the model that you trained or whether the work is coming from your body or whether it's coming from some recording. All of that is work. It's not that one part is tech or one part is HR. It's all about sort of the output that is sort of coming from a person. Mm -hmm. uh, and so finding ways to see that as an integrative whole. Um, and I think that allows us to give a little bit more flexibility in terms of how we compensate people yeah. and what policies we use. You started our conversation sharing a bit about how hard it is to figure out what, like, actually it's how hard it is for us to self-identify what's good about our role, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's also very hard to figure out everyone's different roles in a company and all their different types of work. What are some methods you think we can use for, or, or any, let's say, new chief work officer can use to identify the components of work? How, do, how would they do that? I think a lot of that has to do with observing um how people, the the effort that people put into creating output. Because I think we have a fairly narrow definition of output. So, yeah. you know, it's the, 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 the slide deck you made or it's, yeah. you know, whatever client. But in the process of doing that, you are talking to people. You're sort of providing training for them. Um, you're learning something yourself. Mm -hmm. And in this AI world, you're providing, you know, that, that particular piece of output is going in as training data yeah. uh, for some of these AI models. And I think one thing that firms can do a better job of is just having good data infrastructure yeah. in measuring what people are doing um, and crediting people with the things that they're doing. Yeah. Uh, and so that means keeping track of, of both outputs, but also mm -hmm. time and processes and building that into the review process. Yeah. So understanding what people are doing and then keeping track of what they are, are doing. Let's wrap with uh, one more question about culture. Okay. What are your thoughts? And I mean, you've talked to so many different companies and you've researched so many different organizations. How can companies foster a culture that embraces the changes that are required for having AI in our systems in new and collaborative ways? Yeah, I think there's I think there's a lot of fear around AI um, about and I think it's, you know, it's stoked not just, uh, you know, by by the press, by by sort of the news about what AI, these AI models can right. and can't do. Um, but I think we can think about them as thinking about how can this make my time at work more pleasant? Yeah. Uh, and one of the things that came out of one of our studies was that we looked at these call center workers and it improved productivity a lot. And one of the questions I got was, well, what happens um, to these workers? Do they like it? Right. And there was a lot of skepticism about workers liking it. But in fact, uh, it improved their experience of work. It led to lower turnover. And the reason for that is that it's actually very unpleasant to be bad at your job or to do work that you don't want to be doing. And so what the AI model was able to do is that when a customer yelled at you, it was able to give you something to say to calm them. Oh, wow. uh, and so it improved people's social skills and meant that they got yelled at less. And it meant that people were asking, you, know, you got fewer people saying, oh, can I talk to your manager? Because I don't trust you. I don't think you're calm. Right. And so I think we can think about AI as kind of supporting us in the areas, you know, the parts of our jobs that we we don't like so much that we, yeah. like, you know, this, this model can kind of protect me from right. that a little right. bit. And I think um, in terms of culture, sort of building an organization where we think of these models as here to make our make our lives easier. Yeah, that's such a great to 
a great note to end on of just making work more pleasant. There's so many other things we can do, but you're right. Like, it's unpleasant to not be good at our jobs and be yelled at. And how can these and what can we do to not be yelled at? Right. <laughs> yeah. And and make work more pleasant and have just a much better workplace. Thank you so much for joining me. It's always a delight to get to learn from you and the deep research that you do in this space. Thank, Thank you. you so much for having me. It was wonderful yeah. to chat. And to those watching, thanks for tuning in. 